Welcome to episode 2 of Recipe Redemption. In this series I'm revisiting some of the recipes from my budget challenges, particularly the ones that didn't come off so well, and I'm going to remake them without some of the limitations, hopefully to redeem them. The first one is going to be the porridge. Now it seems like there are as many different ways to make porridge as there are people. In my lifetime experience, porridge is something that's normally made with milk and sugar and oats. I know a lot of people like to make it with water, and that's probably traditional. That's not my experience. I was brought up on porridge that was made with milk and sugar. So I'm going to stick to the vegan restriction. We'll try and make a vegan porridge that's just a bit more creamy um, with coconut milk. And yeah, we're just going to redo that recipe. Now you'll notice I've got a Bombay mix here. I did actually use up my bag of Bombay mix from the challenge and I went out and got a new bag and this is actually quite different. This is a different brand. This is more salty, less spicy than the Bombay mix I had on the challenge. And it's interesting, they do a hot Bombay mix as well. In fact, they do a whole range of different mixes and these sorts of things. And I am gonna use those spicy peanuts in my porridge. In fact, I'm gonna spice it up a little bit more because that spice was really good in there. But anyway, I don't want to use this Bombay mix because it's more salty, less spicy. So I went back to Home Bargains and got myself another bag of this same Bombay mix that I used in the challenge. And so we'll be using that. I've still got some oats left. I've got another bag of prunes. Interestingly, while I was in Home Bargains, I picked up this. How about that? 500 grams of dates for 89 pence. I didn't even see that on my challenge. I probably would have got that instead of the prunes, although it's 10 pence more, but we could have worked around that somehow. But yeah, 500 grams of dates for 89 pence is just absurd. Anyway, let's crack on with this porridge. I will, by the way, do a taste comparison on these three different Bombay mixes later in the video. So someone was kind enough to let me know in the comments that apparently what I kind of accidentally invented was something which already exists. Uh, I forget the name of the person who commented. I will put the comment on the screen. Thank you for your contribution. Apparently in India, it's not at all uncommon to make porridge and then sprinkle something a bit like Bombay mix on top. I can get with that completely. So that's what we're going to do today. I'm going to make the porridge similar to what I did before with the peanuts serving as a milk substitute. But I'm also going to smash up some of this Bombay mix and kind of sprinkle it in once the porridge is cooked because just from the taste of the little bit of spice that we had on the challenge porridge, I can completely believe that's gonna be nice with a bit more spice in it. So I picked out a whole bunch of the peanuts, probably a few more than I had last time, and I'm gonna blend them up with water to make a kind of milky substance that will substitute as milk in the cooking. Some people did say I should have made oat milk to make my porridge, and I obviously have heard of oat milk before. It didn't occur to me to try that, I'm kind of skeptical that adding oats to oats is going to taste anything other than oats, but I could be wrong about that because oat milk is an extraction rather than just oats and water. It is an extraction of oats, so I'm probably wrong about that. And probably if you make oat milk and add it to oats, it will taste more milky than just oats and water. But that sounds like an interesting experiment for another day. That's more peanuts than I used last time, but that's fine. I think that's what we'll have to dress the porridge on top. A stick blender time, we're gonna blend up those peanuts with a little bit of water. And what I didn't do last time, but I think would be interesting here, is just to taste a bit of this peanut liquid, just to see exactly how milky that really is. Obviously, there's a strong flavor of peanuts, but it does taste creamy. Now, I could have got to here by blending peanut butter, smooth peanut butter and water, but since I already have these peanuts and I want the spice, that seems like a shorter cut. So I'm just gonna eyeball the oats going in there and put in what I think is about the right amount of oats for the porridge I want to eat, because they will swell up a bit when they're cooked. So I'm just eyeballing that quantity. That looks about right to me. And we're gonna have a bit of water in there and this peanut milk stuff. A little bit more water, which is also useful for rinsing the last bit of stuff out of there. And then over a very low heat, because I don't want to overcook this. Now, some people just heat the milk and pour it straight on the oats. Some people pour hot water on oats. Some people will cook this until it's really kind of glutinous. I don't think any of those is wrong. If you like porridge a particular way, then more power to you. One thing I forgot to put in here was sugar. And sugar is one of those things that could make this not vegan, but I have checked, my sugar is 
suitable for vegans just to keep things pure i mean we're not sticking exactly to the rules of the challenge anyway but the sugar that i buy doesn't use bone char for it so it is suitable for vegans i myself am not a vegan so if you've got any angry questions about veganism i'm not the best person to answer them for you google is your friend however right i'm just going to taste that for sweetness yeah that definitely doesn't need any more sugar and what about the coconut milk my intention is to cook this until it's thick and then loosen it up with a bit of coconut milk for extra creaminess that looks about right and then a little splash of coconut milk in there that looks about right to me it's a little more liquid in consistency than the porridge i cooked on the challenge but i don't mind that and then as before i'm just going to have a few prunes that i haven't soaked cut up into that now and some people did suggest why not cook the prunes in the porridge i think that would have made it unphotogenically brown it might well have tasted better nothing much wrong with that but i just don't fancy it and while that porridge just gets to goldilocks temperature okay to the table and we'll just start first with the porridge on its own with the dates without the spicy bits in there that's already way nicer. That little spoonful of sugar and the coconut milk has made this creamy and delicious. To my taste, I did use more peanuts as well, and so I can taste those more in here as well. Good. But what we really want to know is what's it like with more spice? Let's find out. I'm going to need a few moments just to process this. Do you know what? That is absolutely delicious. That is really good. I'm not just saying this. Okay, right. So what's going on here? The saltiness of the Bombay mix has enhanced the porridge anyway, because a little bit of salt is not going to hurt. The Bombay mix and the porridge and the prunes... It's spicy like fruitcake. You might think that this would just overwhelm it with a savoury vibe, but it just doesn't. It's spicy in the same way that ginger biscuits and fruitcake is spicy. In fact, it's very reminiscent of those kind of experiences. Fruitcake and Lebkuchen and ginger biscuits and speculoos and those sorts of things. It's got that kind of flavour vibe to it. And what's really weird is the spices in this Bombay mix are bringing out flavours that I know aren't even in here. So there's almost like a banana flavor to this and i think it's just a combination of one of these spices plus the sweetness and the coconut milk is giving me a kind of banana taste so there we go spicy porridge that is legitimately delicious i will definitely be eating this again and as far as i'm concerned recipe redeemed so these three varieties of bombay mix let's give each one a taste and then we'll have a look at what they're composed of so i'll take the same piece out of each one so the co-fresh regular Bombay mix. I'm going to take one of these thick noodles here. Salty with a kind of mild curry flavour. And then the co-fresh hot Bombay mix. Again, I'm going to take one of these thick noodles. Salty, same general flavour profile. More chilli in that one, I can tell. And the Indus Bombay mix. Again, same noodle. Less salty than these two and more aromatic, as well as being almost as hot as this hot Bombay mix here. So number three's got more chili heat than number one. And I would say this almost on a par, I would say probably that one's slightly hotter. Number two, hard to say. But my favourite of the three actually is the one that I had for the challenge, the Indus. It's got a better spice blend, I think. It's more tasty than these two. Just my personal opinion, obviously that's very subjective. Let's have a look at what they are each composed of. So the CoFresh brand is made of three different sizes of noodles. These are gram flour noodles that have been fried. We've got peanuts. I don't know whether there are actually two varieties of peanuts in there, red skin and the regular ones, or whether just the red skin has come off for that one. There are also green and yellow split peas and lentils. 
The CoFresh Hot Bombay Mix is exactly the same components, but with a different spice blend on it. And then the Indus brand is a little bit simpler. So there's only two different sizes of noodles. There are peanuts, there are lentils like the others, and then there are chickpeas instead of the yellow and green split peas. So slightly different, more variety in the CoFresh brand, but to be honest, I think I prefer the chickpeas instead of the split peas. Again, just my personal preference. So that's the difference between these three varieties. CoFresh has got loads and loads and loads of other products, which I didn't buy because it would just be ridiculous to try and compare them all. And I did actually try making that porridge again the next day with the other Bombay mix, the CoFresh Hot Bombay mix. And I don't think it was quite as good. This Hot Bombay mix seems to lean on the pungent spices, whereas the Indus brand leans more on the aromatic spices. And it's those aromatic spices that go really well in that porridge. So interesting to have tried both, but I actually think I got really lucky with that Bombay mix that I bought in Home Bargains in the first place. So for these battered flour fritters, I'm going to do two different versions. The first version will be quite a thick batter with spices in it. And I'm aiming for a sort of crispy outside with a almost cake-like texture inside. And then after that, on a different day, I'll go back out and pick some more flowers and we'll try a really light almost tempura style batter. So I've been out and picked the same wildflowers again and we're going to start with the dipping sauce. So like before I'm basing this on prunes. I've got five or so prunes which I've soaked overnight. I'm going to have about a teaspoonful of dark soy and about a teaspoonful of toasted sesame oil. Half a tablespoon of sugar just for sweetness and for some acidity half a tablespoon of cider vinegar. Stick blender time. We're going to blend that up and then taste it for acidity and seasoning levels. And I think we'll just also have, I meant to add this at the beginning, but I forgot. I think we'll just have a little bit of red pepper, sweet red pepper. Let's drop that in and blend it into the rest of the stuff. So I'll just give that a little taste as it stands at the moment. Pretty good, but I think that needs a dash more acidity. So just a tiny little dribble of vinegar. Taste again, much better. Now I'm making this for two different people, one of whom, me, likes chili, the other, Jenny, doesn't. So I will portion it out into two dishes. And then into my portion, I'm gonna put some of this crispy chili. And again, this is one of these ingredients where it's not always vegan. This one is. This is just chilies and soybeans and garlic and salt and oil. So I'm going to put a couple of teaspoons of that nice crispy chili and stir it into my dipping sauce. So I just got to remember that dark colored dish is mine. Oh yeah. Unlike the challenge where I blended up Bombay mix to try to get a batter, I'm going back to the kind of sauce ingredients here. So I've got some gram flour, which is chickpea flour. I always have trouble opening these. And we're gonna have three heap tablespoons full of gram flour, plus two heap tablespoons full of ordinary self-raising flour. Into the dry ingredients, I'm gonna have a nice pinch of salt, a level teaspoon of sweet paprika, a level teaspoon of ground cumin, about half a teaspoon of turmeric and a level teaspoon of garlic powder. And I think just to make it a bit more interesting, I'm gonna use some of this ground mixed spice, which is cinnamon and cloves and nutmeg. So it's gonna be sweet spices. I'll just blend all of those spices together into the flour. And I'm just gonna make this batter with cold water. So that's probably about a quarter of a cup of water and we just need to keep it loose. I don't want to make a dough. I don't want to make something that's so claggy it won't stick to my flowers or that I have to manhandle them to get them in there. So that's about, it's coming up to about a third of a cup of water now. I think it's probably going to be about half a cup of water with that. So yeah, I'm just going to make that tiny bit looser. We'll let that stand for a bit. We have to anyway, because the oil has got to heat up. Same flowers as before. I've got elderflowers, red clover, and dandelions. I'm just going to check this batter for sort of final consistency, just to see if that's going to cling and if it's going to coat the flowers. It looks about right. Yeah, I'm going to say that's about right. Over here at the cooker, I've got the oil heating up and I've got 
some kitchen paper towel waiting to drain things on. My oil's at the right temperature now and I've got all of my elderflowers already sitting in the batter. So let's just give them a little drain as they go in and then into the hot fat. That looks good. That's just a gentle sizzle. And again, another one. I'm not gonna overload the pan. Well, I think to be honest, I'll probably get them all in there. They're floating up, that's good. Okay, that's all the elderflowers in. They won't take long. And I will just flip them over to make sure that they get really good cooking on both sides. Taking on a slightly golden color now. They're also sizzling less, which suggests to me that a lot of the water has been driven out of the batter now. So out they come, they feel nice and light and crispy. And whilst those were cooking, I got my other flowers in the batter. So we'll just quickly get them straight in the pan. I'm gonna make sure that they take a fair bit of batter with them because they're only tiny. That's it. Really hard to get them to do both sides on these because they just wanna float whichever way up they wanna go. So I'm gonna stop right there. Heat off and get those out onto the paper. Let's get these to the table and when they've cooled down a little bit, we'll give them a taste. Okay, right, that's your dipping sauce. That doesn't have chili in it. Mine does. And there we go, wildflower fritters. And I would say in terms of appearance alone, those are 100% better than the ones we had before. So that's elderflower. And this is a mixture of dandelion and clover here. So dig in, help yourself. I'm gonna try a smallish one. So elderflower first. Let's just break one open and have a look inside. So it's cooked. It's kind of risen like almost like a cake inside, but I think it'll be okay. And I'll give it a taste with the dipping sauce. Let's mm, try a bit nice. of batter on its own. Mm, nice. So the batter is a little bit, not doughy, but bready inside, but I don't think that's a bad thing. You like it? Yeah, dipping sauce, quite sweet. Mm. What do you think of the fritters? We like the fritters. It has to be said, the, the flavour of the flowers is kind of lost in there, isn't it? Mm. Yeah, if you don't really taste the flavour. No. Okay, right, that I think is a clover flower. Let's give that one a try. I was wrong, it's a dandelion. Mm. I like the dandelions, you can taste the dandelion in it. I'm just getting the batter mainly out. Mm. <laughs> yeah. It's nice enough. I mean, it is just an excuse to eat big chunks of batter, which is probably not the most healthy thing in the world. So, what's the verdict, Jenny? Do you like? Yeah. Yeah? Mm. Good? Yeah. For this batter, I'm going to keep it really simple because the spices and the general size and thickness of the batter on the last one did overwhelm the flowers a little bit. So, I'm just going to have less than that. About a tablespoon and a half of corn flour, about a tablespoon of self-raising flour, and because why not, about a teaspoon of gram flour, chickpea flour, tiny pinch of salt, and then we'll just mix those dry ingredients together. There's really not a lot of dry ingredients there, but that's intentional. And then I've got some very cold water here, to which I'm just gonna add a little splash of vinegar, and then we're gonna make a really thin batter. That vinegar also will activate the baking powder that's in that self-raising flour. So that will help it to fluff up and get some bubbles in there. I'm gonna go a little bit thinner than that still. That's it. So th this batter's like the consistency of milk, basically. So we're just gonna dip the flowers in there. They will get the lightest coating and then straight into the hot oil. As before, kitchen paper towel on standby ready to drain and my slotted spoons on the side so I don't have to reach over the pan to get them. This oil is now at the desired temperature and I've got my elderflowers sitting in the batter and you can see how thin that batter is. It's just running off almost like water. So what I'm gonna do is just let that drip off of the flowers until it stops dripping or at least until the dripping subsides a bit straight into the hot fat. And it will need a matter of seconds only 
So I'm just only going to do a few of these at a time. The batter's not going to brown like it did before because it's such a light batter and it's based on cornstarch as well. We know when it's done because it kind of, the fizzing subsides a bit. So that's done. It's crisp. You can see it's kind of gone stiff. And we'll get that out onto the paper. In with the next batch. Okay. And again, as I say, you can tell it's finished cooking because it kind of stops fizzing because the water's been driven out. And it's as simple as that. That's the tempura version of elderflower fritters. Let's go and give that a taste. All right, and because this is very much more of a snack than a meal, I think we just do it as a little sharing platter. So that chili, that dipping sauce has got chilies in, that one hasn't today. So help yourself. Interesting. Yeah, hopefully these will be all right. I'm just gonna try a bit with, without the dipping sauce first, just to see if I can actually taste the flowers. Mm. Yes. Mm. Oh, they're nice. Yeah, it's just like a little bit of fruitiness or something, isn't there? It's fresh. Mm. Okay, and then with the dipping sauce, I have a feeling the dipping sauce is just gonna drown the drown flavor, the flavor really. Mm. Yeah, that's nice. But I don't think the sauce is really necessary, is it? They fall to pieces. Mm, yeah. I would actually say this kind of um, elderflower fritter would be best used as a kind of garnish or something, wouldn't it? Mm. Imagine if you had a, a nice chefy meal with that on top as, a, as just a, a garnish, an edible garnish. I think it'd be really nice. So yeah, if you want to taste the elderflowers, definitely do it this way. But this isn't a meal. It is a very interesting snack though, don't you think? Mm. And they've gone like pearls, haven't mm. they? Flowers. Yeah. So of the two, which do you think you like best, Jenny? I think I like this. Mm. Yeah, I think this preserves the kind of flavour and essence of the, you know, fragrance of elderflowers, doesn't it? Mm. Whereas the other things, I think probably we could have cooked balls of batter without the flowers in and it would have been just as nice. Yeah, dipping sauce just spoils it. Mm. So there we go, elderflower fritters, two different ways. One way or another, I'm gonna say that is recipe redeemed. I hope you enjoyed that. Thanks for watching and I hope to see you again soon.